Well, good morning and welcome to the Men's Leadership Network. I want to say a special welcome to everybody joining us at our satellite locations this morning all across Nashville. Men meeting at Highway 55 in Nolensville, men meeting at Bricks and Cool Springs. And of course, anybody that's catching us this morning, live streaming uh, our interview time or catching us sometime in the future uh, via a podcast. Good morning. Welcome to you all. Uh, welcome to all the men here in the Franklin campus as well. We're glad you could join us this morning. Uh, before we get going, we're going uh, gonna to follow the same format that we usually do. We're going to go for about 30, 35 minutes, and then we're going to pause and take some questions. If you'd like to get questions to Amy this morning, you can do that two ways. First way is you can tweet those into me, at leadership underscore net, or you can email them in to questions at mensleadershipnetwork.com. And we'll throw up some reminders throughout the interview uh, so that you can have those, those links as well if you have questions to get in. This morning is my guest to introduce our speaker, Amy Alexander. Amy is the co-founder and executive director of the Refuge Center for Counseling. The Refuge Center began in 2005 and provides nearly 17,000 counseling sessions for more than 26, uh, 2,600 clients annually. As the executive director, Amy encourages and supports the culture of connection, character, and continuous growth within the Refuge, Refuge Center organization. She's a licensed marriage and family therapist and has been practicing for more than 16 years. Her areas of clinical focus include trauma, domestic and sexual violence, grief and loss, organizational culture, and identity work. Amy is trained, trained in brain spotting, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. We'll have to talk about that one later. That's a, that seems pretty interesting. And trust-based relationship interventions. She's an American Association of Marriage and Family Therapy approved supervisor and a clinical fellow of the association. Amy and her husband, Dan, who's been a guest with us in the past on Men's Leadership Network, have been married for 13 years and have three children, ages 10, 5, and 3. Please join me this morning in welcoming Amy Alexander. Amy. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much for being with us, Amy. Yeah. Uh, you're brilliant. I mean, just listening to all that, that's amazing. And um, just your whole career and what God's done. Tell us a little bit about your faith story. I mean, how you came to know the Lord and just your journey with Him. Sure, yeah. yeah. So I was born and raised in Spokane, Washington. Raised in a non-traditional uh, or non-denominational setting. Mm -hmm. My father was a pastor of a small church, and he was also the Bible teacher at the small Christian school that I attended. And I remember accepting Christ one day while riding my bike to the post office. <clears throat> Just had that private conversation with the Lord. I was mm. probably 10 or 11 years old. And I think there were two things that really helped the, the light of Christ to become a real live thing in my life, mm -hmm. more than just something you did, a dutiful thing. One was our family went through some difficult times in my teen years, and I started working with a Christian counselor. And so I went to Christian counseling every year from ages 14 to 20. Wow. And in that counselor's office, he often had scripture available. I, I feel like I was raised in that office. And we, uh, we talked about things of the Lord and um, made decisions about my life in that office, and that was really pivotal for me. Wow. The other thing was that I began to take mission trips. And some of those were overseas, but some of those were uh, in the States, and I, I would say the, the one that was the most impactful was a couple of trips I took to inner city Los Angeles. Uh -huh. And it was to, in those trips that I began to gain perspective about my life and others and started, uh, you know, deciding that I wanted my life to be about serving the underserved. So. Wow, I, I love that. And, you know, studies have shown that it, students, you know, even at, at high school, middle school ages, start to go on mission trips, it changes their perspective. Yes, and, yeah. and I think that's a big deal for, especially us as dads who are yes. watching, you know. Yes. Um, talk about how God impacted your career choice, because you had a lot of opportunities to do different things, but God kind of moved you into this area. Talk about that. Yeah. So I, I had this sense that I wanted to work with people who were hurting, mm. and um, after a couple of missions trips to Los Angeles, I actually decided to take a year and move to inner city LA. So I lived uh, in Compton. I lived at 46th and Western, and my neighborhood was run by the Rolling 40 Crips. I lived in a 10,000 square foot abandoned nightclub with another girl. The building was owned by the Center for Student Missions, but we were the only 
two that lived there, and it was my desire to not go in uh, as anyone of influence. I didn't want to be a probation officer or a social worker, no, nothing of hierarchy. I just wanted to be a member of the community. And there were a lot of things that happened that year. It actually ended up being, to date, the deadliest year in South Central. Um, g gangs were so prevalent. I remember a young man being shot in front of my building. At, he was 15 years old, and it mm. took the coroners two hours to come get his body because there was so many uh, incidences occurring in LA at that time. So being in Los Angeles, I started to develop a heart for kids who wanted out of gang life and just didn't have a lot of other options. We were eight miles from Santa Monica and most of the kids in our neighborhood had never seen the ocean. Too dangerous to cross these territories. So I came back to Tennessee to finish out my master's degree and started to share my passion for kids wanting out of gangs. And I discerned fairly quickly that, uh, you know, Williamson County might not be the place to have a, have a home for kids, <laughs> zoning challenges and those kinds of things. So as I was in my counseling program, the Lord really uh, turned my heart towards, hey, let's start a, an agency where people in all walks of life facing all kinds of things can come and receive hope and healing. And, um, you know, how has God impacted my career? Well, I'll speak to Refuge Center specifically yeah. because I've spent 13 of 17 years there. Refuge has outpaced anything we ever could have dreamed or imagined. It's always grown faster and further than we, we could have ever believed possible. And the metaphor that I've used is I've thought about being a part of Refuge. It's the, it's the grand adventure, I would say. But so often it felt like driving a car down a dark country road at night in the fog and you couldn't see very far ahead of you, but you knew if you stayed close to that white line on the side, you'd get right where you were supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And for me, that white line has always been Christ. And if we treat people right, if we do the right thing, if we have integrity and faith, then God will take us right where he wants us. There's a quote that says, let us tend to the depth of our ministry and then let God tend to the breadth of our ministry. So let's take care of being deeply rooted having integrity and faith, and then let, let God take care of the rest. That's awesome. I mean, praise God. Um, Amy, how did you kind of feel God leading you to, you know, you, you co-founded the Refuge Center, yeah. and which is now, I mean, such a huge part of this community, and, you know, seeing so many people and so many people from our church and others uh, who go there and yeah. find healing and find hope and yeah. help, and how did God lead you to start this ministry yeah, yeah. So 2005 opened, right yeah, open the doors in 2005 with the vision to do a couple of things for one we wanted to be a systemic organization which just means a place that the whole family can be served in one location but we felt like the gap in services was a couple of things one typical nonprofit stereotypes are we, we think about community mental health as cinder block walls poor quality of care high turnover long wait list we just said, we're not sure that community mental health or nonprofit has to look like that. So what if we could have a place that had cutting edge technologies and modalities, therapists that were well trained above and beyond the master's degree and warm welcoming facilities. And what if we could pair that all with a sliding fee scale that anyone could afford regardless of their situation? So that was the dream. We opened our doors. We grew 1,000% in our first five years of operation. We've grown 15 to 50% every year since. We just provided our 110,000th counseling session. Wow. Probably provide over 20,000 sessions this year. Our fee scale ranges from 25 to 110. Um, our cost is 79, but on average, clients are paying about 51. So that delta is what we have to fundraise to stay open. We're receiving referrals from over 80 sources, lots of churches, physicians, yeah. private practice clinicians, and uh, we're seeing unprecedented demand for services at this time. Right now, we have over 60 people on our wait list, which we actually really hate to see that, because mm -hmm. people call when they're hurting, they call when they're in crisis, and we don't like for people to, to have to wait. Yeah. But people are in need of this service, so it's, it's just been more than we could ever have imagined. And how many people do you have working there at the Refuge Center? 54, 54. people, and we share 16 offices. <laughs> That's amazing. So. I mean, could you imagine in 2005 when you were just starting and no. God was calling that where, no. I mean, no. it's amazing no. what God's doing. You can't doing. take any credit for what Refuge has become because, again, it, it, it's beyond what we could have imagined. And it, only God, only God could have done this. We, we do have a vision for the future, and that's mm. that we hope to purchase four to ten acres in Franklin and build a lodge-like facility with 
uh, walking trails, a prayer chapel, a prayer labyrinth, playgrounds, healing gardens. And to our knowledge, there's really nothing quite like that in the country for the 50-minute visit on a sliding fee scale. Mm. And um, we shared our vision at a fundraiser in the fall, and a woman approached us afterwards, and she said, what I know today is that the Refuge Center will become the St. Jude of mental health. Wow. Is what she said. And I had to think about that for a minute. But when I think about St. Jude, I think about a one-of-a-kind facility, great access, you'll never be turned away, mm. and that if your loved one is going there, they're in great hands. And so when she said that, I said, that resonates with me. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, I love your vision. I love your passion. And, and, and talk about this for a moment, okay? Because, you know, a lot of times guys, especially men, since this is men's leadership, uh, we want to put on the um, portrayal that everything's okay, yeah. right? And we live yeah. in an affluent county, especially here in Williamson County, but also an affluent city. Nashville just, you know, exploded. And yet, so many times guys won't ask for help or they won't say, you know, hey, I'm not okay. How, what, how do you speak to that to men yeah. who are struggling, yeah. you know? Yeah. Well, you know, image management is important to all people. That's not just... Mm. Male specific. Pe people want to be perceived as strong and wise and good. Um, but thankfully, people like Brene Brown have started a global conversation around things like courage, transparency, authenticity. And we're hearing more and more this phraseology of it's okay to not be okay. Mm. And we're starting, I think the tide is starting to turn around the fact that asking for help is a sign of wisdom and strength. There's some research that says at any given time, we all have 3.4 blind spots. And what that means is that these are things that are very visible to the people in our life. They could quickly tell us what we probably don't recognize about ourselves, mm. but, but it's, um, it's not visible to us. And so we all need to invite professionals and, and personal relationships and ask people to say, hey, speak into my blind spots. What do I not know about myself? What do I need to work on? And probably for everybody in this room, they've got a dentist and a primary care physician and a mechanic, and really it should be normalized that we also need professionals who can help us with emotional support so we can live the fullest life possible. I like that. I mean, I don't like that we all have three to four blind spots, <laughs> <laughs> but I love the idea that, yeah, we're willing to ask for help when our car breaks down or we're willing mm -hmm. to ask for help when... Mm -hmm. You know, we're sick physically, but yeah. why not ask for help on the front end instead of trying to battle through? Yeah, even just being proactive yeah. about something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what do you say to men? Because men are problem solvers, right? I mean, we, we like to get in. We want to solve the problem. And, and sometimes, you know, even with our spouse or with our kids, we can't. And we don't have the skills or the relational um, training to be able to do that. What, what do you say to men about allowing them to ask for help and and being people to receive help too. Yeah, yeah. So there was some interesting research done by someone named Shanti Feldham, and uh -huh. she wrote a book called For Women Only. It's about the inner experience of the man, but she interviewed over a thousand men, and 75% of the men she talked to said that they would rather be alone and unloved than to feel disrespected or inadequate. So they wow. would rather be alone and unloved than to feel disrespected and inadequate. So when your spouse is bringing you a care or concern, out of that rooted need to feel adequate uh, comes probably the quick jump to, to problem solving because underneath that is the fear that maybe I'm not enough or I don't have what it takes. And unfortunately, that fear, which drives the problem solving, um, backfires at times and it can lead to a lack of connection or intimacy. Mm. But there just, there needs to be room for emotions without having to go right to solutions. And, uh, you know, I think that Brene Brown, going back to her, she does this little cartoon clip on YouTube, definitely worth, worth watching, and she talks about the difference between empathy and sympathy. So in this little cartoon, this animal falls dar down a dark hole, and there's another animal standing up top and says, I'm so sorry you're down there. That, that must stink. That must be really dark and scary. That's sympathy to say, what a bummer, I hate that for you. Yeah. In the next clip, the little animal climbs down a ladder and gets in the hole with his friend and says, I'm here with you. That's empathy. Mm. So that's the difference. Well, you're not just noticing or problem solving, but I'm in it with you. We're mm. in this together. 
I love, if we could do that in our marriages, what a difference that would make, right? It's a game changer. It's a game, yeah, yeah. And I think so often, you know, it's just like, okay, I'm sorry you're going through that and pat them on the head and move out because we got to go to work, we got to get stuff done. And yeah. yeah, and so moving from sympathy to empathy, that's, yeah. that's really good. Yeah. You know, because I do think we want to solve it instead of just listening and being mm-hmm. there mm-hmm. Um, for our spouse, for our kids, mm-hmm. um, for people in our workplace even. Mm-hmm. Um, what are some warning signs that you see with guys? You know, I, I love your perspective, but you see a lot of men, you mm-hmm. see a lot of men in our community and a lot of successful men, but what are some warning signs that you see for us as men that, hey, there's some, there's some things that the check engine light's coming on in your life, you know? Um, you, you need to get this thing checked out. Yeah, yeah. In general, I think that anxiety is a cue point, mm. anger. You know, I, we have a therapist at the Refuge Center who Friday mornings runs a men's emotions group. He uses Chip Dodd's material, The Voice of the Heart, and each week they go through one of the eight core emotions. And many men will start that group saying, I feel comfortable with two emotions. I'm comfortable with gladness and I'm comfortable with anger. Anything else is, isn't an option for me. I'm very uncomfortable around that. And so it's about normalizing the fact that we all have emotions. Emotions are actually little messengers that are meant to tell us something, that something matters to us, mm. that something's not okay, that kind of thing. I think, though, specifically, if we were going to talk about you know, big warning signs, uh, uh, flashing red lights, and we were gonna go into this topic of power and control. Yeah. Um, so in the 1980s, there was a group of individuals who formalized uh, the, the power and control wheel. They're called the Duluth Project. And what they did is they essentially outlined for us some of the areas of concern that we need to be mindful of. On the outside of that wheel is physical and sexual violence. So if those kinds of things are happening in the home, then that's a significant concern. The law would call that abuse. You can get help and protection in those areas. But by the time it's reached physical or sexual violence, typically a lot of other things have been going on for some time that we knew felt bad, but we didn't know to call it abuse. Mm. So things like starting with emotional abuse, so name calling, putting someone down, making them feel bad about themselves. Coercion and threats. If you leave me, if you tell someone, I will dot, dot, dot. Intimidation, and that could simply be looks, actions, or gestures that let someone know this could get bad. It could also be, um, uh, you know, it could be entitlement because I'm the man or because I have the money or because I have the job. It's my responsibility to set the roles, to Mm -hmm. determine what you can and can't know. And that starts to feed into um, financial control, perhaps only having limited access to knowledge about finances or having to turn in receipts. It's that king of the castle mentality. So there's a lot of things that help us understand that the dynamic of power and control is in place. And that's kind of the what is happening in relationship. And that's a, that's a helpful thing to reference. The, the why and the how that occurs is a, a separate diagram we call the cycle of violence. And so in that, we see that many relationships start off in a honeymoon seduction or peacemaking phase. And, you know, if we went out on a date with someone and on the second or third date they socked us in the gut, we're not going out on a third date. So it starts really good in the beginning. And typically, you know, we feel very cared for and seen and invited into relationship. But at some point, it starts to take a turn. And we head into that tension building space where our partner is. Um, constantly irritable with us, frustrated, and we're, we've, we just feel like we're getting it wrong. Mm. Um, Lundy Bancroft in his book, Why Does He Do That? He calls it the garden of resentments, where my partner is tilling away at these negative grievances and stockpiling them to be used as weapons mm. for later. Um, I call it the list, that there's this list that I don't know what's on the list, but I can't ever seem to get it right. Kids were too loud at dinner parked on the wrong side of the driveway, looked at somebody the wrong way. So I just can't get it right. When that list gets long enough, there's an explosion. Mm -hmm. And that may be physical or sexual violence. It could also be that promises are broken, threats are carried out, uh, you know, yelling and screaming for hours. But there is that sense that if it was ever here, it's gone to here. And there's this power over dynamic. If it was a linear thing, you know, I don't know that the dynamic would exist, but it cycles back very quickly to honeymoon seduction and peacemaking. 
and that is, I'm so sorry, this will never happen again, we'll get help. But unfortunately, this is not real change or repentance. This is hooking you back into the cycle and making me feel better about what I did in the explosion phase. And around and around we go. With each time through the cycle, we're seeing that it increases in, in frequency and intensity, and it gets to be more and more dangerous. The rescuer, the rescuer and the torturer are the same person in this dynamic, which is very confusing to someone who's in it. So if there's any of that at play, I would, I would highly recommend referencing the power and control wheel and the cycle of violence. And, um, you know, the, the research isn't, isn't great around, or the statistics, I should say, aren't great around someone turning a corner once they've entered that space. And unfortunately, that's because it's not, it's really not about anger management classes or, or sobriety, uh, you know, of course, alcohol and anger can escalate situations, but this dynamic is about what someone believes, it's about what they value, and I can go get sober, I can do 16, 28 days at Cumberland Heights, but if I have not changed my values about how I treat my spouse or what I believe about marriage, then ultimately those behaviors won't change either. So this is the long haul work. This is somebody who's gotta get into counseling and be under the care of a professional. I've gotta untangle, where did I pick up these values? Where did I learn that this was okay or this is the default mode for when I'm frustrated or angry? And I've gotta be willing to look those values in, in the eye and say I'm, I'm abandoning these. And the hard part is that this cycle is very beneficial. I get my way when it matters most. My needs take priority. Everybody kind of dances around me because if I get mad, it gets ugly, so everybody's tiptoeing around me. And so you're, you have to forfeit the right to those privileges and really submit yourself to a process of growth and healing as you reevaluate your values. So it's, it's a lot of work. Wow. It, it, it is. And, and for guys... Um, to step back and to say, hey, my marriage isn't healthy or my family dynamics isn't, and, and I need help, you know? And, uh, and I, I just want to encourage every guy in that because don't just stay in that cycle, yeah. right? You know, I mean, yeah. if, if there's work that needs to be done, do the work. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and I'm yeah. so thankful for people like you and um, others who, who really step in with men and with families and because you want to have a healthy marriage. You want to be a great dad, you wanna be a great husband. And so often we get caught up in that and we don't. It's funny how we'll go get a coach for working out or for training or something else, but in those areas, we, we wanna make it happen. Right. And there's warning signs all the time that are saying, help, you yes. know? Yes, so, yes, exactly. Wow. Talk about that, Amy, as, as we kind of move from, you know, family to really organizations or workplaces. And, and organizational culture and health, I mean, that's something you really, specialize in, and it's something we're seeing, it's a big thing in our world today. Um, so talk about that for a minute. Sure, sure. Yeah, definitely turning a corner here, but ultimately culture, uh, you know, by definition is the stories, rituals, and values in our organization. It's our professional identity. And that this is something I'm extremely passionate about. I don't by any means consider myself an expert, but I consider myself a hungry student. <laughs> so constantly learning. Our staff attends the Global Leadership Summit uh -huh. each year, and that's a place where we're really fed and challenged in this area. And I would say um, that there are some go-tos for us, some hallmarks of culture that are really important as we think about a healthy environment. So one of those things is Henry Cloud, who uh -huh. of course co-wrote the book Boundaries and has a great book out called Integrity. He says that if a speedboat is right on target, headed right where it wants to be, that it's gonna leave behind it a balanced wake. And in organizations, a balanced wake is the balance of outcomes and relationships. So we've all been in environments where it was heavily weighted on relationships. And maybe it's a family here and we kind of avoid hard conversations or we don't make hard decisions because we don't want to upset anybody or hurt any feelings. But ultimately the organization suffers because of that. We've all been in places probably too where it was very outcome driven. And really, I don't know you, I don't know your story, but bring me the numbers, show me the results. Mm. And so we wanna try to hold those things together if possible. Um, I, you know, diving a little bit deeper into the relational side of that, being a counseling center, we spend a lot of time on that piece. 
Um, we do some fun things that really help us to see each other. We, we have an attachment-based leadership culture, and Daniel Siegel talks about that as being bonded to one another in a way that we can relate from a place of kindness and compassion. You know, what a great starting place when we're good. talking about work relationships. And so there's four hallmarks of that. We want people to feel seen, safe, secure, and soothed. And so in that seeing space, when we have a new hire, we'll ask them to come to our team meeting, and we call it the five windows, to bring a little bag of five things that represent their story or the mm. journey they've been on. So they may bring a picture of their family, a cross, a memento from childhood, but they begin to tell us about who they are, mm -hmm. their makeup, what's important to them. So we really want to work hard to see people. We do that through inventory, so strength finders, values in action, the DISC, the Enneagram. Um, we have a director of compassionate care at Refuge, oh, that's... and so her role is to pour into the people that work there. She's got a couple of interns on her nurture team, and so that looks like prayer and gift cards and hospital visits, and if we're pouring into the people that are working there, they've got the margin to pour back into the clients that we're serving. A couple other hallmarks of healthy cultures, I think, is brave apologies. Mm. So that's when leadership has the courage and humility to privately at times and publicly at times say, I missed the mark. Mm. I messed up. I, I missed the cue you were giving me. Mm. And I want to ask your forgiveness for not meeting the need the way I should have. Um, another one is the, the art of withdraw. So, so often leaders, especially I see this in nonprofit and probably other ministry settings, our work feels so urgent. Mm. It really does feel life and death. People are hurting, they have a need, and it's immediate. And as leaders, we feel so responsible to be on and on call. Mm. And many times we forfeit our own needs or even what our family needs to be the hero or the rescuer in those ministry settings. And so it is tremendously important for leaders to be able to step back, pull back. I love that you guys offer sabbatical formats here. Mm -hmm. But to go, you know what? The world doesn't revolve around my ability to care. This is about God, and he can take care of people with or without me. Mm -hmm. There's a book called Sabbath by Wayne Mueller that I highly recommend to every leader. And that book actually led me into a two-and-a-half-month sabbatical where I said, let me take... Take my hands off the wheel here, and God can do this without me. And that's an important reminder for a healthy culture. Otherwise, we um, start to see ego and all kinds of things rise up, and that's not about the Lord, and that's not what he wants in our workplaces. Mm, that is so good. And I think if we're healthy as a leader in an organization, then that brings organizational health, right? It does, it but does. if the leader's not healthy, we're not healthy, then it that's just, right. it, yeah. Talk about this. I mean, the, the Me Too movement is, is a really big deal today, and you see that uh, everywhere. I mean, it's, it's impacted, you know, everywhere from Hollywood to workplaces all over. How can men, you know, from a female perspective, how can we as men have healthy boundaries with our female colleagues? Yeah, yeah. And how do, how do we do that well in our organizations and where we work? Yeah. So I loved getting this question from you, and it's been a really fun thing over the last two weeks because when I received this question, what I did is, first of all, I contacted all the females that work at the Refuge Center, and I said, just point blank, how do you feel like this is going? Do you feel, do you feel respected by the men that work here? Do you feel like your boundaries are observed? I got four pages of feedback from the women, wow. primarily saying, this, this goes really well here. I feel very respected and cared for. And here's some examples of that, and here's why I'm proud to be a part of a place that does this well. But it felt good to ask the question. So then I asked to meet with the men, and we actually huddled up last Friday for lunch. I brought my notepad, and I said, I'd like to hear from y'all. Clearly, this is going well. So what are some of the things that you do mindfully and intentionally to help the women that work here feel this way. So I brought their feedback oh, with good. me. Yeah. And some of it doesn't seem earth shattering, but p perhaps just a good reminder. So, so the men at Refuge said they give women their physical space. They're just mindful of proximity. Mm. Okay, so that seems basic but pretty important. They said we have pictures of our families and our children in our offices. For any female that walks in our door, we want them to know this is my first priority is these people. I love them. I'm proud of them. You know, That's good. family matters. 
they told me that they don't make assumptions. So, for example, an assumption might be, well, since you're a woman, you probably need help with this computer issue or lifting the boxes out of your car. You know, don't make assumptions. Say, is there a way I can support you? Is there a way I can help you? But don't jump in with the assumption. Um, they told me that they were very mindful of emotional conversations with their female coworkers. Mm. Okay. Um, they said that if they've ever heard a man make an inappropriate comment, they went to that person. That's that Matthew 18 principle. But they said, hey, that, that felt a little off or that was a little unsettled after I heard that. We should talk about this. So that peer accountability. Mm. And then finally, you know, one of them said, I know I've... <clears throat> missed the mark, and I have learned to ask forgiveness if I'm concerned that something was inappropriate or offensive. And so, sometimes I'm not even sure, but if there's any doubt in me, I go right to that person and say, may I ask your forgiveness if I offended you? So, Man, those are, that's really good. Yeah. I'm glad you said that because I think for a lot of guys today, right, we feel like we're walking on pins and needles. You know, it's just like, and, and you, mm-hmm. you almost want to just put up this wall uh, and not have any kind of relational, but, but you work together. And so um, those are very good. I mean, just to give us some boundaries that would say, hey, this is healthy. Because yeah. you want to have a great work environment. Yes. You want everybody around you to succeed. Yes. And, um, and I think, thank you for sharing that. Because, uh, yeah, it, it's a big deal, mm-hmm. you know? And it's, uh, it's cost a lot of people their jobs and in, in, mm-hmm. in years of, of work. Uh, and, and for us to do that right and do that well. That's yeah. good. Yeah. How do you deal with conflict or generational sin? Like if, <clears throat> if there's something that a guy is dealing with that, that's been passed down from their father, their grandfather, it just, it seems like that's my character, that's my nature, that's just who I am. Mm-hmm. How do you help men break that kind of cycle? Yeah, you know, when I read this question, I think the first place my mind and heart went is just to four words, and that's do your own work. Mm. Own what's yours, <laughs> do your own work. Yeah. And so, you know, this is about being the healthiest that we can be physically, spiritually, emotionally. It's about putting the right people at your table to help you excel in those areas. I mentioned to you earlier that there's some other great research that talks about we all, to be at our best, we all need four to seven people in our life, not family members, who can ask us hard questions, find our blind spots, challenge us, encourage us. These would be our iron sharpens iron people. And I think many people, men, women, are hard pressed to name one or two because Mm. we are so isolated and we, you know, people aren't really in the inner workings of our life. And so we have to be intentional about asking people to speak into our lives and support us and mentor us. So I wanted to give examples of who these people might be because sometimes you think, I don't even know where to start. Yeah. I mean, I can show up at a, at a men's group or at a morning like this, but frankly, I don't have the first clue how to open up and, and invite people into that space. So it, it might be a therapist for a season, mm-hmm. and it's okay to call and get that kind of help. It might be a spiritual director, a pastor, a small group leader, a life coach, um, an Enneagram teacher. It might be a Celebrate Recovery group that you go to, AA, men's groups. It's about being a learner. So what are the podcasts you're listening to, the sermons, Mm -hmm. certainly being at church consistently. And then what are the daily practices that you have for self-reflection? So I really love some contemplative practices. The daily exam is one that I highly recommend. But it's about what am I allowing to pour into my life? Who's speaking to me? And how have I fortressed myself, uh, taken responsibility for what's mine, but fortressed myself with people who can help me be the best I can be? So. Wow, that, that's good. So four to seven. Four to seven. Yeah, not family members mm-hmm. who are willing to speak into your life. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay, tell me this. Spiritual leadership, give us two takeaways for what you see for us to be spiritual leaders as men today. Yeah, I mean, probably just a recap of what I just said. Do your own work. (laughs) Do your own work, I love that. (laughs) And then be very intentional about what's pouring in. Many of the guys here have long drives to work, they're on the road, they're businessmen, and um, you know, you you can have all kinds of things 
you know, that you're listening to, but choose a sermon, choose yeah. a podcast, yeah. choose worship music. Yeah. Um, you know, that idea of being renewed every day. I heard um, Pastor Stephen Furtick yeah. out of Elevation yeah. Church in Charlotte yeah. preach a sermon once, and he talked about how we want our spirituality to be like that old infomercial. I don't even remember the crock pot or what, but it said, set it and forget it. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. And we want to say, well, we went to church on Sunday, and we're good till next Sunday. But every day we have to be inviting good things into our hearts and minds and refueling. Mm. And I think using that time, that is such a, you know, it takes a long time to get to work. Yeah. You know, the commutes get longer and get home. What are we doing with that time? You exactly. know, and then preparing yes. our hearts before we walk into the door, you know, that we're prepared at work, we walk in the door, we walk in the door at home, we're prepared mentally yeah. uh, to go into those environments, you know, yeah. and prayed up and shored up. Yeah. So that's, that's great advice. Um, tell me this, what do you want your legacy to be? Well, I love that you ask that question. I, I heard uh, Francis Chan once talk about start with the end in mind. Mm -hmm. And that's what that question is. It's mm -hmm. starting with the end in mind. I've got a tattoo that I got 20 years ago and it says live intentionally. That could mean a lot of things to a lot of people. Underneath that for me, it's about loving intentionally. And I guess just to unpack that a little bit, um, I'm a type one on the Enneagram, so uh, pretty results oriented. It's about being efficient, moving the ball forward, checking the list. And, you, you know, I can get to a pretty duty driven place, mm -hmm. but ultimately that's my inner critic that's fueling and driving that. And I think I worked for a lot of years out of that space, just move it forward, get it done. And when I took my sabbatical, I was, I was weary. I was so tired. And so mm -hmm. I spent 10 weeks working with a life coach, a therapist, a yoga instructor, an acupuncturist, and a spiritual director. And I pretty much crawled up on the oper operating table and I just said, I'm sick, just go. Just help me, you know, I want to be well again. And one of the things that we looked at is this idea of, you know, of course, in um, 1 Corinthians, mm -hmm. if I speak with the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. If I have all the prophetic powers, understand all mysteries, and have all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. And so I started to think about, you know, what is the pace of love? Mm. How quick or slow does love move? How do I move at the pace of love? Because I can get a lot of things done, but it's done from perhaps an anxious place or you know, a space that's less than healthy. Um, in Psalms it talks about, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted in streams of water which yields fruit in season. And I had to reframe in my life, what does fruitful and prosperous mean? Mm -hmm. And in scripture, you know, a faithful pace is sometimes a slow pace. And so for me personally, what does it look like to slow down enough to, to be a loving, kind person where it's not about how much I've accomplished, but it's about how well I've loved because in the end, uh, you know, nothing else really matters. Wow, so. amen. <laughs> That's awesome. That is so true, too. And we are so results-oriented, especially guys, you know. And, and sometimes we miss it. You know, we just miss it. Yeah. And uh, we miss our spouse. We miss our kids. We miss the people around us at work. And, you know, it's love God, love others, right? Yeah. So, hey, we've got some questions for you, Amy. Sure. You ready? All right. Thomas? Yeah, Amy, I think you're going to hit that 20,000 uh, counseling sessions sooner than later with the number of questions that men are sending in here. <laughs> <laughs> How do you discern whether an issue is a mental health issue or more of a spiritual issue? Yeah, that's a, that is such a great question. I'm not sure that I've ever been asked that. You know, I think it's, we're, we're holistic beings, uh -huh. right? And so all of that is so intertwined, our emotional health, our spiritual health, our physical health. I think some of the current neuroscience research would say that all of that is connected. Um, and that's where I would encourage people to have this team of individuals around you. That's where you want a pastor who's speaking well into your life. 
Perhaps it's a spiritual director. I, I have spiritual direction at two o'clock today, and I know what I'm gonna bring my concerns before her, and she's gonna say, where is God in this for you? <laughs> Where are you discerning the voice of the Spirit in these decisions that you need to make? And so having people that can approach your concerns from that perspective. And then, you know, a therapist who's gonna look at family of origin issues and past trauma and all of those, those layers. So inviting a lot of good people into your life to look at all the components. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. I mean, it is all intertwined. And, you yeah. know, God created us, and we're spiritual beings. And out of that flows everything else. So, yeah, if this relationship's not right, then it yeah. impacts everything yes. else. And um, so, yeah, I think you deal with all of that together. Great question. Man, that was a good question. So, Thomas? Next one's just as good. How do, you, how do you best broach the subject of counseling with a friend or family member? What are some good things to say, and what are some things you shouldn't say? If, if you feel like they may need counseling? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, what we'd want to avoid is ever going to that place of shame, mm. sh shaming someone into getting help. Um, you know, I, I love, we, so much Brene Brown, but she says, we know we're ready to tackle something when we can put the problem in front of us rather than between us. So I think that's a great approach to take when you're talking to someone about a need is to say, I'm on your team. There's this challenge I see in your life or the struggle, and I want to be with you and for you as we approach this together. Mm -hmm. I think of that beautiful St. Arrhenius quote where he says, the glory of God is man fully alive. Mm -hmm. And how can we help our friends and family members unpack the burdens and wounds and traumas that keep them from living this full life which ultimately reflects the glory of Christ. Mm. So just approaching it from a positive, encouraging, I'm with you and for you place. Yeah, I would just add that too, just, just take the initiative, you know? Yeah. I think yeah. so often we don't wanna say anything because we're afraid we're gonna say the wrong thing. Yeah. Um, but when we do speak up or we do encourage somebody, I think it, it communicates, I care about you, yes. you know? Yes. I, I want the best for you and whether they do it or not, it's, it's kind of up to them, but it, at the point, just don't sit back. And I think as mm -hmm. men especially, stepping in, if there's challenges with our marriage or with our kids, you know, don't just think, well, time's gonna heal that, well, I'm just not gonna deal with that. Step into that, you know, yeah. and, and yeah. help. Um, That's the definition of courage. Yeah. Courage is not the absence of fear, but the judgment that something is greater than the fear. And what's greater in that situation is your loved one finding freedom. So push through the fear. Mm. Have the talk. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah, that's good. All right, one more. Yeah, one. let's get one more. Um, this is good. Amy, I'm a reader, but I don't have emotional or relational health books on my queue, in my queue. Of those you referenced today or others that you know of, is there one book you'd recommend based on what we've talked about today? Well, we've covered so many different things. I, th I think I referenced Integrity and Boundaries uh -huh. by Henry Cloud. I referenced Sabbath by Wayne Mueller. Um, this isn't a book, but just the examine practice, the daily examine practice, I think is a, a beautiful resource to start our end or day with. Um, those are a few that come to mind. Do you yeah, have I other think, suggestions? Well, I, I think those are great. I mean, the, the Henry Cloud books are amazing, yeah. and they really are. I mean, the Boundaries one is, 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 is so good. Um, but coming back to daily practices, just even, you know, Jesus Calling or yes. Oswald Chambers yes. or something that yeah. you start your day with yeah. in the Word, centered, you know, that you have that time with the Lord and then to grow out of that. Yeah. Um, but I think how you start impacts how you finish the day. So yes, yeah. starting that day with those daily practices is, yeah. is so good and so yeah. important. So, Amy, this has been awesome. Thank you. I mean, I feel like we could keep going for hours. I mean, every one of these is, <laughs> is fantastic. But um, thank you for taking the time to speak to us and to challenge us. And now it's time for us to do the work, right? You know? Do your work. Do your work. Do your work. <laughs> I always say nobody wants to go see a dentist who doesn't get their teeth cleaned. So, you know, we, we have to take personal responsibility uh, for the, the health in our own life. So, yeah. yeah. Well, let me pray for us. Thanks. And I'll turn it over to you, Thomas. Father God, thanks for today. And God, thanks for Amy. Pray a blessing over her, over her family, over the Refuge Center, Father, and so many people. Um, God, they're being impacted and helped um, through this incredible ministry. And I pray for us, every man watching, every man listening, 
uh, every man that's here, I pray, Father, that we would be men after your heart, that we would be godly husbands, fathers, that, God, we would live our lives for you and that we would be healthy. And, God, I pray today that you would give us your spirit, you would go before us, God, prepare the way. Um, but Father God, let us do the work that it takes to be the men that you've called us to be. We love you, Father. Thanks for this day. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Amy. We, uh, I've got a page full of notes, of course. So, <laughs> uh, hey, guys, as we wrap today, I want to remind everybody you're going to get an email this afternoon. It's our Rewind email, the Men's Leadership Network Rewind email. It will have a link to today's uh, conversation and interview. Uh, real simple. If you want to blast that out, share that with some of your peers, it's real easy to do it that way. Uh, if you want to get on that distribution list, you can also, there's some cards on the table here, or you can go to mensleadershipnetwork.com, and you can get on a distribution list for that email as well. Uh, there are almost 55 interviews on the Men's Leadership Network website now covering a broad range of topics, so it's a great resource for men uh, in our community. Uh, as we wrap up today, I want to let you guys know that next week will be our final interview for this uh, semester, this season. Our guest will be Ben Majette. Ben is the Director of Growth and Strategy at LP Corporation, Louisiana Pacific Corporation. And uh, while he does growth and strategy uh, for a career, next week we're going to be focusing on the way that he applies growth and strategy to raising his children. So you don't want to miss that. We'll get started at 645 next week. Thank you. Thank you.